Linus Tech Tip, a very popular YouTube channel, got hacked yesterday on March 23rd, 2023. It's appropriate the use of the word hack here because the way the attacker got access is a very hacky way indeed. Uh, they didn't really need the passwords. They didn't really need to reset the password, so to even bypass SMS or like multi-factor authentication. It's not even that. They use another trick, which is called session hijacking. And uh, I want to unpack that in technical details and go into go through all of these layers. Let's jump into it. So TLDR, what really happened was uh, one of Linus's team member has a YouTube account, and that YouTube account has full access to all Linus's channels. They were logged into YouTube, and we know that when you log into any site that supports authentication, the moment you log in, the server will respond back with a nice response header called set cookie. And that set cookie will have a value that authenticates you in the future. It's called the session token or access token or refresh tokens. It depends like like what kind of authentication it is. And that cookie is now stored locally on your browser in a tiny SQL light database called cookies, at least in, assuming Chrome. And for every request, future request that goes to that same domain, in this case, youtube.com, that cookie will be locked up in the SQL light and it will be sent in the request cookies header as just a text, right? The server will receive that cookie, will take that content, and it knows that in this particular case, this content is a session token. It will look it up and it says, oh, oh, you're, you're X, and it will just authenticate you. Why? And the reason is because HTTP is stateless, because every request in HTTP must include pretty much everything the server needs, because you can't rely on information that is persisted in the memory of that server, because that server can go away anytime, right? Every request can hit another server. So that request must have everything it needs, right? It must transfer any state with it to the server. So, so what happened here is, I think this team member has downloaded some sort of an attachment that ended up to be an executable, that executable run on that local machine. And that executable, that malware, got access to the cookie SQLite database, taken that SQLite database, it decrypted it. I'm going to talk about that because it's actually encrypted. How can it decrypt it? Because it's running as this as a process in the same user space as that other users. So if Chrome can decrypt it, of course, another process can. It's the same machine, right? Once we have the decrypted version, right, which is literally another column in the database, in that table, they sent that SQLite cookies file to the attacker. The attacker took that file, replaced their Chrome uh, local file, fired their Chrome, go to youtube.com, voila, they're logged in as the team member. Right? And just like that, now they can go. As, as, it's as if someone just authenticated again, right? It's as if Google received another session token uh, just from another IP address. Right? The attacker probably smart enough, knows that Linus is in Canada, so probably used a VPN to, as if to log in from Canada, just to make sure, not log in, just to, to, appear, to appear to be an IP address from Canada, so that session tokens in this case it's probably going to be validated so uh it's close enough right i mean google is smart enough if if the same session token is all of a sudden came from canada and then a few minutes later it's in i don't know japan uh, it, it's gonna ra raise an eye bro and it, it will it should invalidate that i'm pretty sure google has uh, guard logic of that I mean, it depends, like you might, you might have your laptop, you have logged in and then you actually took a flight to Japan from Canada and then you, you just fired Chrome again. Uh, that's probably, there is like a limit. They will say, all right, uh, there is like a X amount of hours. You probably just traveled. 
things like that. But again, this is out of the question. We might discover that later. But that's that's what happened, right? And then they started their scam, the crypto scam, and all that stuff, right? So that's that's technically what happened. So let's let's actually dive deep into what exactly, uh, what how cookies are stored in Chrome. You see, uh, cookies are stored in a SQL light, as I talked about it. And this is literally a table called cookies with uh, the host key, which is the URL, and the value called value, that's the unencrypted cookie. And there's another column called encrypted value, right? And pretty much in that, that's back in 2014, they moved to the encryption. Previously, they everything was unencrypted, right? So you can technically take that SQL light as is, paste it in another Chrome, and it will work magically that's not like the case you can you can try it now take a chrome took there is i think it's in the local cookie in the local app data slash network slash default paste another chrome it will it will fail it will not it will not detect it and the reason is because it's encrypted and it's encrypted with a local encryption key that's actually in the same it's a different directory but in the same user profile so the the thing that you need to do as a, as the attacker the malware you have first to read the cookie file, which you can because you're running as a process as that user. You can need now to decrypt the content, decrypt the value of that. And, and it's not hard. There are many scripts online that I found that actually you can do that. Right? So say, hey, I'm, I'm running as me. Why don't you let me decrypt my own cookies? Right? And that's the trick here. So you can decrypt that content and store it as another column called the value. And now it's a plain text. And Chrome is, is responsible to read plain text cookies. Yeah. So yeah, uh, so we talked about how cookies are stored. We talked about how cookies can be hijacked after uh, decrypting it. And then once you have that version of the cookie SQLite, you can transfer it anywhere and technically it should work. That's how they were able to do it. And it's all because they were able to run as a script locally. right? And I think Fiojo goes into really good details of how you can even enter my machine, right? This is like one note file tricks. There was like, this one, this one got me, it was really interesting. You can hide, you can, you can trick the extension to show as a doc, but it's actually an AXE by, by, uh, by introducing a right to left special ask, uh, special character which will flip that because i'm i speak arabic so i i understand how this works because i actually when I, when I want to type in arabic you do a special key to actually flip and start writing from right to left and and and, and i understand that it's it's really confusing to read arabic and english in the same sentence it's so confusing right? it's it's so understandable that people took advantage of this to actually hide the extension I'll make a reference to his video. That is very interesting. All right, so let's finally talk about the session tokens here. So the session tokens, at least in OAuth, which I think YouTube uses, are two types, right? There's the refresh token and there's the access token. When you first authenticate with YouTube, you get back a refresh token. And this is a long-lived token, usually weeks, right? Or even more than that. And then your... The code in your browser, the YouTube JavaScript code, will use that refresh token to get something called the access token, right? And that access token is what we're talking about that will be used and sent with every request. So you get that and get a temporary one, maybe 30 minutes and one hour, right? And that access token will be stored locally, right? And then will be sent and will be used with every single request. You visit the page, you visit, you open this YouTube video, the access token is always sent. And that access token eventually expires, or prior to get expired, the refresh token will detect, or the, the code will detect that, and it will a request a new access token. And the attacker can do all of this stuff, because guess what? The refresh token and the access token are stored as cookies, right? So what you can do here is, what kind of remedies, what, 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 what can YouTube, what can Google do in this case, right? I mean, Linus mentioned this in his video, I suppose, this morning. He said that, well, 
why don't google why don't you you monitor us all the time you know what we're doing why don't you just see our habits and see okay we, usually this session or this user uh upload a single video does a bunch, bunch of editing changes the titles changes the description but now if they are doing something drastic like deleting a bunch of videos maybe prompt them for the password which they don't have if they got prompted if the attacker got prompted for the password they they will immediately fail right prompt them for if there is a, a like a drastic action prompt them invalidate the access token that's another way if if it's coming from a completely different ip address which it's an easy thing to go uh to circumvent by the attacker just use a vpn to simulate that you're in canada right you might say why don't you have why don't we send more information about the device that is using this access token such that we associate the access token with the device that is being used but think about it this means that javascript in case this is because this is a browser right that means javascript must have access to the device information because like you can't like access the mac address seems like a security thing i don't, i wouldn't i wouldn't allow that <laughs> right it's like a catch-22 javascript is so you know nasty when it comes to these things you can't allow us to have all this thing right you can say oh i'm gonna access certain device identifier or a unique hash that identify that but then you get into a privacy thing right like uh, that's a whole different topic that i don't know anything about and i'm really frankly speaking not interested even about it's like oh i don't want anyone to fingerprint me and understand that's like it's it's a really a catch-22 what do you do if the moment you expose the device id then there is a way to uniquely get identified right and unfortunately you know corporates use this identifier to sell you more stuff across other 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 machines other than them but in this particular case could be useful to prevent session hijacking what one thing i can think of is like if the ip address change prompt me for a password i'm fine with it give that give that as an option to me chrome in the browser only in the youtube app i don't care why because i'm a mobile device I'm, of course my ip address is going to change every few you know, I don't know if, whatever, right? Every interval. But if I'm hooked to Wi-Fi, chances that my ISP will change my IP are very rare. It's gonna stay for for a long time, right? The IP address, the public IP address that is assigned to technically my router, is it's not gonna change, right? So yeah, leave it that. If it changed, prompt me for a password. And at least for me, I, I use Mac and I use Safari, and everything is just really using this nice, you know fingerprint and just use this fingerprint and then log in it's like i don't even remember anything right passwords it's not it's not like i i, I use the mouse just literally put my mouse then log in you know so logging in is not really a problem per se when it comes to that even if you prompt me i'll just do do that all right guys that's it for me today gonna see you in the next one goodbye